Good morning. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray that as we look at your word, your spirit might in, empower us and enlighten us to understand what we need to hear from your word today. Give me strength and wisdom. And give our hearts openness, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, it has been made clear to us from uh, the scripture readings today, as well as the sermons that we've heard in this series, unity is an objective fact accomplished by Jesus Christ. In other words, it's not merely an aspiration. It's not merely something that we hope we might have. It is something that Jesus has done because of what he has done for us on the cross. There's one body, one spirit, one Lord, one baptism. Elsewhere, Paul will say things like there's no longer Jew nor Gentile, slave nor fe- male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That unity is a fact. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it this way, Christian brotherhood is not an ideal which we must realize. It's rather a reality created by God in Christ in which we may participate. The more clearly we learn to recognize that the ground and strength and promise of all our fellowship in Jesus, is Jesus Christ alone, the more serenely shall we think of our fellowship and prayer and hope for it. But as we've also seen from the Scripture reading and the sermons that we've heard by Pastor Watson and also Zach's, there is a keen responsibility that we have to live into this unity which Christ has established. There are virtues for us to develop. There are actions for us to do. And so today, as we look at Philippians 2, I want us to lean in a bit into the practical realities of what it means to live for Christian unity. And we might say to live for racial reconciliation. In Philippians 2, Paul encourages the Philippians certainly to be united. But he also teases out what I think are four things that are required of us if we are going to be people that are actively pursuing racial reconciliation. The first comes in verse 1, and Taylor read it for us. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. The first thing I think we need to learn from this text is that if we are going to be agents of reconciliation and unity in the church and in the world, We must learn to depend upon God's grace for us in Christ. It's an interesting thing. You know, Greek grammar uh, experts can talk about what kind of conditional is this. Uh, But I think the point is that Paul is asking us to ask the question, do you have any encouragement in Christ? Do you have any comfort in his love? This is more, you see, than just abstract status. This is more than simply saying you are in Christ, full stop. This is asking the question, is there encouragement? Is there comfort from His love? Is there sharing together in the Spirit? Is there an experience of tenderness and compassion? And it's a real question for us today. Is that our experience? For certainly that should be our experience in the body of Christ. Daily, we need to experience the ministry of God in our lives through both the Holy Spirit and through the work of the body of Christ. And I fear some of our lethargy about unity has to do with the fact that we have separated ourselves from these things. I've often told myself and pastor friends that you must minister out of the grace that God gives you. Therefore, you must be engaged in the habits, the disciplines of grace through which God will give you His strength, His encouragement, his comfort, his sense of camaraderie and purpose. And friends, the moment we let those things languish, the moment we cease being equipped to be ministers of the gospel. So that's the first thing. It requires depending on God's grace for us in Christ. I like to press in and say it's not just simply God's grace for us in the gospel, abstractly, but the provision that God gives to us daily to equip us to do the things that he wants us to do. God's grace is, of course, our forgiveness, but it is also our provisioning, our strengthening. And what's also interesting, Ben, on the context is that the emphasis here is not simply that that's just something between God and myself. That's something between myself and others who are in Christ. 
Philippians 1 talks about the unity that we are supposed to keep. And that's a theme that's flowing all the way through the book of Philippians. So if we understand the encouragement that we receive in Christ, certainly it is the encouragement also that we receive from those who are Christians around us. We cannot pursue Christian unity or racial reconciliation by ourselves and in our own power. We need the ministry of God's grace in our lives. We need the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and we need the ministry of others in our lives. Point one. The second point from this text is that if we are going to be agents of unity and racial reconciliation in our churches and in the world, it requires committed relationships with Christians who are different than us. Can I say that again? It requires committed relationships with Christians who are different than us. Look at verse 2. Here's where the admonition comes in. Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Now, being like-minded or having the same spirit, being one in love, is not a kind of robotic thinking. It's not kind of cloning our thinking. Everybody has to think exactly the same thing. Rather, here is this picture of people that are different, that have different approaches and different ideas and different perspectives, and the command that Paul is giving to them is that you need to work towards being of the same mind, on the same page, with the same love, and those last two phrases, I think, are implying on the same mission. Be like-minded. You remember Yodia and Suntuki, chapter 4. These two women, sisters, who were co-workers with Paul. Don't miss that part. They were co-workers with Paul. Significant ministry. And yet something happened. They got into a disagreement. They started to pull apart. It certainly would have been much easier for Paul to say, just avoid one another. Don't cause trouble. But instead, in, in Philippians 4, he says, I plead with them. Be the same, be of the same mind in the Lord. And then he rallies those around him and says, help them to accomplish this very thing. My whole point here is, being of one mind takes work. It's much easier to just go to your separate corners, go to your separate congregations, go to your separate small groups, and give up on being of one mind. Because it takes work. And certainly isn't that the case with racial issues. It's much, much easier to just say, you guys stay over here, we'll stay over here, and avoid all the hard work that it takes to actually be one in Christ. Part of the problem is that I think there is overall a general erosion of the kind of committed relationships and community needed to do this kind of work. Those who study um, developments in modernity and post-modernity are quick to point out that modernization has chopped up our communities. And it has chopped them up and made us consumers of our own relationships. If there are relationships that attract me and I like, then I enter into them. If I don't like them, I abandon them. If I like my neighbors that live right next door to me, I'll engage with them. If I don't, I'll ignore them and open my garage and go in and never see them again. We have the ability to choose and select who and what we relate to, who we relate to, based on our interests, our convenience, our comfort, and our perceived benefits. And brothers and sisters, if we're not careful, our Christian community will follow those same lines. We will find ourselves fellowshipping with those whom we find it convenient, with those who are like us, And we will say it's not worth the energy and effort to cross the boundaries of race, of ethnicity, of culture, of nationality. It's like water, you know. You pour water and it goes down the path of least resistance. Sometimes like water, our relationships are passive. They flow along the path of least resistance and they increase the likelihood that we will all pool together with people that are the same as us that share our views. Add that to that, our technological world, where we can pick our friends and we can listen to our blogs that reflect the kinds of things that we believe and we agree with. 
very dear friend to many of us, a person who is very highly esteemed, Dr. Paul Hebert, missiologist, anthropologist, wrote an article that I always enjoyed, among the many things that he wrote. In 1993, he wrote this article called The Church, Club, Corporation, or Community? And he insightfully asked the question, is the church functioning as a club or a corporation or a real community? And he says a club is like this. A club is a voluntary association of individuals for a narrow purpose, like bird watching. Its basis is on self-interest, what the club does for me. And its basis is also on consensus, the say that I have. In a club. That's a club. Is our church and our communities kind of voluntary clubs? Narrow interests, narrow focuses, as long as they serve our interests. Or is the church a corporation? Corporations are based on formal contracts, roles defined by specialization, goods and services provided to others. This style of church is concerned with planning and program building and achieving quantitatively measurable goals such as attendance and contributions. And we've all heard people talk about churches as Christian service providers and Christians as consumers. In contrast to these two types, Dr. Hebert says this, the church, when it's a true community, is a group of people committed to each other and the group. That's the first word, committed. In multifunctional relationships of interdependence. Oh, now you're meddling. Interdependence. In which the well-being of the body and of other members, here we go, takes precedence over one's own personal desires. That's community. And I want to suggest to you that's the kind of community that is absolutely essential if we are going to be God's agents for racial reconciliation. We need to have committed, interdependent relationships with people who are different than us where that commitment is evident. I love what our racial reconciliation statement says. If I can pull it up here. It says, TIU commits to the biblical practices consistent with peacemaking and racial reconciliation. And then point B under that, that's point one. In, by intentionally creating spaces in and out of the classrooms where members can develop, listen, deeply meaningful and transformative relationships across racial and ethnic boundaries. Regularly modeling the Christian practice, the Christian practice of hospitality, repentance, and forgiveness. So, brothers and sisters, real question for us, the challenge for us, isn't it? Is not just that we be for racial reconciliation or for unity. The question is, are we able, with God's grace and God's help, to resist this kind of kind of commercialization of relationships that serve us at our whim? and instead engage in relationships which are committed, interdependent, and place a priority on the other with people who are different than us. So the diagnostic question for me and for you is, where are those relationships, and how are you building them? How are you reaching out to know people that are different than you or than me? And then how are you building trust? How are you listening How are you learning to acknowledge the lack of trust and seeking to gain it in your commitment to others? All of these things take work. None of them are simple. None of them are easy. None of them are microwave solutions. But it seems pretty clear from this text that if we are to be of one mind, then we need to be committed to people who are different than us in committed relationships. Thirdly, verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Well, there's an opportunity for me to say. There's a little bit of a chiastic structure here. 
And it goes from don't do anything from vain conceit or, uh, uh, sorry, don't do anything from selfish ambition or vain conceit. And then we flip it around. Valuing others is the opposite of conceit. And then looking out for others is the opposite of selfish ambition. So I'd like to take those one at a time. First of all, the third thing that is required of us is to humble ourselves, to value others above ourselves. Well, isn't it true that we live in an era where there seems to be no limit to hubris and arrogance? My wife and I have often talked about this and wondered whether just arrogance is now considered a substitute for competence. As long as you act like you know what you're doing, then you must. And so we find this in all realms, don't we? We find this in the political realm. We find this in the church realm. We've had a few sad stories about people that have got a bit too big for their own britches and as a result ended up getting into immoral issues because presumably of their inflated sense of their own importance, of their own leadership, of their own, uh, dep- of their own uh, importance in the ministry of God. And so Paul says to us very clearly, brothers and sisters, don't do anything out of vain conceit. Guard against that. Watch out for conceit. Conceit is an exaggerated self-worth. It's building a ladder where you're on the top and somebody else is on the bottom, or at least one rung below you. Conceit is asking, how do we rank people? And you know, there are many ways to rank people, aren't there? We can do it according to uh, attractiveness. We can do it according to, and here's, here comes a big one, education, intelligence, wealth. And I think the danger for us is that even as Christians, as we begin to accomplish certain things in our life, presumably even with good motives, the more we accomplish the more it is tempting to say, look what I have accomplished. And then to say, here's the real kicker, this is the real measure of the worth of a person. Whatever it is. Education, wealth, all these things. And then think of how people who are different than us, different races, different economic, socioeconomic uh, stations of life, different, different people from different countries, how do they fare on that ladder? Well, oftentimes, they don't measure up. And that's where racism becomes incorporated into our own conceit. Even their ability to speak English. Some people wrongly think that if you have a southern accent or you can't speak English well, you must be dumb. And that's still floating around. So Paul says, be careful. Do nothing out of vain conceit or arrogance or hubris. And friends, we too need to go about that in an educational institution. Because we have many people here who accomplish many good things for God. But the more we accomplish, the more we need to beware of conceit. Now the solution to that is humility. Well, what is humility? I think humility is not false modesty. You know the kind I mean. Oh, oh no, 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 I'm nothing really. I'm really. Uh, praise be to God for all that he's done through me. Uh, there is a kind of false humility that we can have that really is saying, I know I'm great, but I know I shouldn't act it. I know I shouldn't be a jerk even though I am great. That's not the kind of humility I'm talking about. The kind of humility is a humility that comes not from seeing others in light of our accomplishments, but of seeing ourselves and others in view of God and His grace in our lives. Fundamentally, we remember that we are all made in His image. We are all loved by Him. We are all valuable. We are all sinners saved by grace. And all the ground is level at the bottom of the cross. I love what Paul says about after extolling all the things that he could be boasting about. And he brings this up a number of times in his his writings. 
Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. You see, that's his perspective. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Humility comes from seeing all of us from the perspective of the gospel and of God. But there's something else to say here. I think the admonition to value others above yourself also presses us in about what is really valuable to God's kingdom purposes in the world. We have a hierarchy for that too, right? If you preach, if you teach, that's really important. If you just serve people, that's not very important. You see, we have a kind of of, of temptation to become conceited even about our ministries and even about our ministry gifts. We become conceited in saying that I really, or even implying, I have nothing of value that I need from you. There's nothing I really need to learn from you. That's conceit. Not only is it conceit, but it's bad ecclesiology. Right? What does Paul say? He says we are one body. And the eye can't say to the foot, what? I don't need you. And so when Paul admonishes us to be humble and to value others above ourselves, he's not talking about some fiction, just pretend people are more valuable than you are. He is actually saying, see yourself in light of the body of Christ, where you as an eye or a foot or a hand can't say to the other parts of the body, I don't need you. You are, in fact, valuable to me. You are, in fact, essential to me. And if we are to live as the body of Christ and the community of Christ, those who stand on the outside and apart and are different are essential to the mission of the body of Christ. And it is only arrogance that says, we're doing fine, thank you very much. We don't really need your expertise. We don't really need your perspective. Everything is going well. I remember how I was struck with this when I uh, ministered in Singapore for about a decade. I had the privilege of bringing what I knew to these students, and they were appreciative, and I enjoyed talking to them about hermeneutics and New Testament and uh, interpretation and other kinds of things, biblical theology. But it didn't take me long to realize that, that it, compared to them, I was an infant in understanding Christian suffering. There were also ministry insights and wisdom that they had because of their culture that I was completely ignorant of, complete blind spots in my understanding of Scripture and my reading of Scripture, where I was not interpreting even the authorial intent correctly because I had those blind spots. Community was one of them. To notice, hey, all those second person plurals, uh, all those second persons are plural. Oh, really? You mean you're talking about a community of people and not just me and Jesus alone on a hill? And now I, my eyes were opened up to all that was the ecclesiology that was there. And my brothers and sisters from Asia helped me understand that and see that. They also helped me to understand the necessity of grace and the strength that comes in the midst of suffering. I was like an infant compared to that. And so I had something to contribute to them. But if I had stood back and said, no, thank you very much. I am a white Westerner and I know everything. I would have been impoverished by the contribution that they have made to my life and continue to make to my life. And I think, brothers and sisters, that's what it's about when we talk about having a learning community here at Trinity. We all come from different places. If we are a diverse community, all of us need to realize that we need one another and we need the expertise, we need the insights, we need the perspectives that each one brings into this learning community. There is a danger, isn't it, that we will become our own echo chambers. And I confess that as a white man, yes, I am a white man, that was a joke, that there is a danger and a caution that can happen, something that can happen, just simply because of the people that I am familiar with, you know, water flowing in its least resistant way. I'm, re I, I'm, I'm familiar with certain authors. I'm familiar with certain ideas. I'm familiar with certain perspectives. 
I can, if I am not careful, just simply gather around myself an echo chamber that just reinforces it. And then think of what happens to our dear brothers and sisters from other places in other cultures and other experiences when they never, ever, ever read somebody except for a white male. What does that say? Well, I didn't mean to say it, but what it ends up saying is, thank you very much. We really don't have much to learn from you. And we can see how this happens, and it happens even passively and without malfeasance and mal even, even wrong intent. But it means, brothers and sisters, that we have work to do. And I think one of the ways that we can do that as faculty and as students is to continue to press and encourage one another to press out our horizons, whether that's in bibliography, whether it's in understanding ministry, whether it's in scholarship, so that we have the benefit here at Trinity of being truly a diverse community, taking advantage of the diversity that the Lord has given us in this place. Fourthly and finally, if we are going to be a people in a community that is working towards racial reconciliation and Christian unity, we need to reject selfish ambition to look out for the good of others. Here's another big one, right? You have vain conceit, hubris, pride. Another one here is selfish ambition. Here is the word that talks about having ambition that is geared towards one's own advancement, towards one own, one's own reputation. All one's efforts being swallowed up in one's career, in one's status. Paul was in prison, you remember in chapter 1, and he said there's some people that are preaching the gospel out of selfish ambition. They wanted to make a name for themselves. That didn't bother him because he wasn't a man of selfish ambition. It wasn't a competition. The point was, is the gospel being preached? But of course, we live in a culture of competition and ambition, don't we? And it's very difficult for us to adjudicate between ambition that is for God and for His kingdom and ambition that is for us as ministers of God in His kingdom. I think one of the litmus tests of this is what would happen if all of a sudden your name was taken off of anything and everything you wrote or did or accomplished? Would that bother you? <laughs> I wrestled with that question. Do we do great things for God or do we do great things in the name of God so that we'll get the credit for it? This is one of the reasons I think Jesus teaches about anonymity, right? Don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. It doesn't mean we have to go around not signing our papers. Please don't do that. It doesn't mean we have to go around never writing a journal article. But the real question that Jesus is asking is, are we doing things in order to be recognized? Are we doing things in order to gain our reward? Because he says, you have, if that's the case, you have already received your reward. That's it. Instead, work for the reward in heaven. And so there are opportunities for us to help others and to do good for others without it having absolutely any benefit to our careers, to our advancement, to our reputation. That's the edge that, you, that, that Paul's talking about. Do nothing from selfish ambition, but rather look out for the good of others. How do we look out for the good of others? I think we need to look out for the good of others by being aware of their needs, but then also stepping in to action. Later on in Philippians, Paul refers to Timothy. And he uses Timothy as this example in, um, in verses 19 and following, as one who, who was looking out for the good of others. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. Here's a person who is concerned about others. And Paul can rely on that. For he says, everyone looks to their own interests, verse 21, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself 
because as a son with his father, he has served me with me in the work of the gospel. Here's Timothy as an example of one who over time has proved himself to be one who is not just concerned about his own agenda, his own career, his own education. You fill in the blank. But he is concerned about others. And in our discussion today, I think it's particularly important that we give us ourselves opportunity to know about the needs and the concerns of others who are not in our own particular racial economic group. It's not an abstract thing. It's not just having sympathy for a newsreel. Reel, that's an old thing. A news, a, news, uh, a news story. And then saying, oh, that's too bad. It is actually stepping up, taking time out, and doing something about it. Well, we've seen how Paul challenges us. Yes, we have a unity in Christ, but we are required to do things. We are required to depend on God's grace in Christ. We are required to commit into relationships with people that are different than us. We are required to humble ourselves, to have a check on conceit and value others above ourselves because of their diversity. And we are called to reject this all-absorbing self-ambition, to carve out space, to care about other people, and to do good to other people. Brothers and sisters, this is our calling. And I won't for a second say that it's, it's easy. Because in many, many ways, these things are running diametrically opposed to the values and practices of our culture, our common culture. And so we need to band together to help one another. As Paul said to those two women ministers in his church, be of one mind. Work at it. And then for the rest of us, Help each other to do that as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace to us in Christ Jesus. And we thank you that grace extends to people of all colors and races and nationalities, ages. Father, we are grateful for your love for us. Lord, help us to be people who lean in to community to lean into relationships, to lean against conceit and selfish ambition, all for your sake and all in light of the fact that that's exactly what you did for us in Christ Jesus. We pray this and ask this for your grace and for your strength. In Jesus' name, amen.